Hi there, everybody. It is great to be with you at Aletheia Online today. My name is Justin, and today we are continuing in our sermon series, Awesome God. Now, in this series, we've been looking at specific encounters in the Old Testament. And in these encounters, something unique happens where God is given a name, and this name discloses something about his character. Now, what we think about God couldn't be more important. In fact, I would say it, it's probably the most important thing in the world. And, and I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being hyperbolic. If God himself is at the center of the human experience, which is what the scriptures tell us, then what we think about God impacts everything. I mean, think about it this way. And I used a, an analogy last week in our Providence congregation that fell flat because people didn't know who I was talking about. So I, I'm, I'm going to try a different analogy. In the same way that what you learn about a pilot's expertise or incompetence would affect how you feel on an airplane and on a flight, if God is truly sustaining the world, if he is the creator, the sustainer, he's the one that, that all of this exists to glorify and that we exist to glorify, what we learn about him will give us that same kind of security and the confidence. And as we meditate here at the beginning of, of a new year on who he is, extraordinary security and comfort and encouragement can come from that. Now, we've looked at a couple of encounters so far, one with God and Moses, one with God and Gideon. And we learned you know, in Moses' story that God is our Lord. In Gideon's story, we, we learned that God is our peace. Now, we're going to look at an encounter that a woman named Hagar has with God. And she gives God a name, and that name is our God who sees. Now, let's dive into the scriptures. We are going to be in Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16, and you may or may not have heard of the story of Hagar. This isn't kind of one of the most familiar parts of the scriptures, but here we have kind of two more familiar characters, Abram and Sarai, who later become Abraham and Sarah, but they're actually the antagonists in this story, and it's God's care and his vigilance over Hagar that really shows us his character. So let's read it, Genesis 16, the entire chapter. I'll read, then we'll pray, and we'll see what Hagar means when she gives God the name, our God who sees. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, she is your servant, and she is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, Where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction." He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. 
For she said, truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahairoi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask that he would guide us in it. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who sees. God, my prayer is that by the power of your Spirit, you would lead and guide us into all that that means today so that you might be glorified in our eyes and we might be comforted and strengthened. In Jesus' name, amen. I've been thinking a lot about this title that Hagar gives for God, the Lord who sees. And I realized that the word see or to see is really um, the same meaning as to care. It's synonymous with care. If you look after someone, you care for them. Or on the flip side, if you feel overlooked, that means that you don't feel cared for. And that's precisely the way in which Hagar uses the word. You see, Hagar hasn't received the care that she should have. She has been not just overlooked, but she has been ignored and pushed to the side by Abram and Sarai. So what does God do? He sees her and he takes action and and, and he assures her that he sees her pain. And it's meant to communicate that he cares for her. Now, I think this is so important, you know, in my own experience and in people I've talked to, non-Christian and Christians alike, the degree to which you believe God cares about you has a significant impact on your relationship with him. Some people who don't follow Jesus I've spoken to, and the thing that maybe keeps them from it is an experience that they had maybe in their younger years or in their past that made them feel overlooked, that made them feel as though there wasn't care there. And their, their question is, I think you know, their, their, their concern is God must not care for me, given that I went through that. Likewise, many Christians who I've talked to, myself included, the dark nights of their soul came in moments where they felt overlooked by God because of a painful experience that they went through. Hagar's story is fascinating because it it presents attention to us. Hagar is experiencing and will experience difficulty, and yet in the very midst of that difficulty, she has a revelation that the God who is caring for her is a God who sees her pain in the very same moment, even before her circumstances have changed. So there is a way in which we can experience the care of the God who sees right in the middle of our difficulty and be strengthened by that. There are three profound things that we learn from or about the God who sees in this chapter. First, we learn what he sees. Second, we learn his response to what he sees. And third, how we know that he sees. What he sees, his response to what he sees, and how we know that he sees. So first, what he sees. You know, th- this might seem like a bit of a silly heading because if what you learn about God in scriptures is, is that he's all-seeing and he's all-knowing, know- and that's certainly true. But what for Hagar specifically does he see? Well, he sees that she has borne the brunt of other people's faithfulness. In the story, Abram and Sarai are the antagonists. Their actions have produced the harsh treatment of Hagar. And Hagar seems to have no no say when Sarai gives her as as a wife to Abram. Now, there is the issue of like she may have looked on Sarai with with pride or or with arrogance. But if you look at, you know, If this situation is a pie, Hagar's slice is very, very small. But the way that Abram and Sarai treat her is really really bad. And it's frowned upon in this passage. We're told in verse 2, 
that Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Now, in in Sarai and Abram's time, surrogate pregnancy was actually a pretty normal practice for wealthy families. But notice that this is chapter 16 in Genesis, which follows chapter 15, in which God confirms his promise to Abram. And God makes it clear that the way that Abram's, you know, kind of lineage is going to be a part of his blessing is going to be miraculous. But Sarai is impatient and she's convinced that God has obviously lost the plot. So what does she do? She takes matters into her own hands. Now, how do we know that the author is painting this in a bad light? I've, I've had some conversations with, with, with people, and part of the issue that they have with the Bible is chapters like this that seem to endorse you know, harsh treatment of slaves or polygamy. How do we know that the author is painting this in a negative light? Well, I think this chapter is a perfect example because what we really need to realize about the scriptures is that not everything described is endorsed. Did you get that? Not everything described in, in, in a passage of Scripture is necessarily endorsed. And the way you figure out what the author does is, is the details that the author includes to paint that situation in an unfavorable light. So here's how he does it in Genesis 16, is that he makes these parallels, and there are far too many parallels to be a coincidence. He, he makes parallels with Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3 is when our first parents rebel and sin against God. So here are just two examples. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 7, look at, the, look at the language here. It says, she, being our first mother Eve, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Look at verse 3 in Genesis 16. The second part, it says, that Abram's wife took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Now, Bible commentators point out that the language here lines up really, really closely, is almost identical. And our memories are meant to, you know, our memories are meant to spark and go back to Genesis chapter 3. In the same way that our first mother seized the fruit trying to take control into her own hands, kind of seizing power and authority away from God. Sarai, fed up at how long it's taking for her and Abram to have a child, seizes the opportunity and comes up with a plan that is culturally endorsed, but not endorsed by God. And she gives Hagar to to Abram, her husband. Sarai is not the only one at fault, though. Abram is also at fault. Look at the language in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, where God is explaining to Adam, our first father, what he did wrong. God says to him, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. And look at verse 2. After Sarai comes up with this plan, verse 2 of Genesis chapter 16 says, And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Same language. Now, there's nothing wrong with taking the advice of your wife. But what's happening here is the same seizing that Eve does in Genesis 3 is the same seizing that Sarai does in Genesis 16. And the same apathy that Adam shows in Genesis chapter 3 is the same apathy that Abram shows in Genesis 16. It's very clear that the author is painting this in a negative light, and he, he, he does not endorse the, the actions of Abram and Sarai. In fact, an interesting note, you know, some people might ask, well, doesn't the Bible endorse polygamy? Look at every example of polygamy in the scriptures, just like here in Genesis chapter 16. Anytime polygamy is in play, things go terribly, terribly wrong, terribly wrong. And the scriptures show that this, these are unfavorable actions, unfavorable choices. And what God sees 
is that Hagar, Hagar is victimized by Abram and Sarai's unfaithfulness and their mistrust of God. The reality is that sin always has its victims. And many times, the pain that you or I might experience in life in a, in a situation might be no fault of our own. In many cases, it might be the actions of, of, of others that we have to bear the brunt of. You know, in my childish understanding of sin, when I was growing up, I always tried to, to you know, draw back a painful experience that I had to a bad decision I made. But as you grow older, you realize, oh, no, 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 wait. People's decisions have ripple effects and collateral damage that, that affect not just themselves, but others as well. And when God shows up to Hagar, he assures her that he sees her affliction at the hands of Abram and Sarai because of the bad choices, the unfaithful sinful choices of Abram and Sarai. These are often some of the most difficult circumstances or experiences to handle in our lives is when through no fault of our own, we are hurt by somebody else. I want to actually have you take a moment and pause and see if you can identify a situation in your own life in which you were overlooked or in which you experienced the ripple effects of somebody else's sin. Take a moment, like even grab your phone or grab a notepad and write that down. Write that down. Because if our God is the God who sees, Hagar's story assures us that God sees that. And God cares about that. God sees it. And the fact that God sees it is actually both a comfort and a warning. It's a comfort that God sees the ripple effects of other sin that that affects us. But it's also a warning against unfaithfulness. Like so many passages of Scripture, it's a comfort and a warning. So the God who sees, sees this. Second, We find out his response to what he sees. God's response to what he sees. And he has three responses. First, he affirms our pain. He affirms our pain. When the angel of the Lord shows up to Hagar and starts speaking to her, and then he starts telling her of the promise. Look at the language in verse 11. Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. Your affliction. When God starts speaking to Hagar, he describes what she has experienced as affliction. Now, we don't know exactly what Sarah was doing to Hagar. You know, we're we're told that she dealt harshly with her. We don't know exactly what her actions were, but... We know that they weren't pleasant. They were probably very, very difficult. And I love the fact that God comes to Hagar and says, I see that what you are experiencing is affliction. God doesn't underplay or or undermine the grievousness and the seriousness of the ripple effects of sin that hurt us. God doesn't come to us and just say, well, pull yourself up. By your bootstraps, when God sees sin affecting his children, it grieves him. It absolutely grieves him. And he doesn't say, oh, it's not that bad. Oh, life is tough. But he says, no, it's serious. It's painful. Second, he gives us a path. He, he gives Hagar a path. We're told that he comes to her and she's on the path to sure. Now, commentators point out that she's returning home, like probably where she came from. And she's on the way there. But the angel of the Lord speaks to her, and he actually tells her to return to Abram and Sarai. Now, something I need to address, because I had this question when I read through this passage almost immediately. 
I ask the question, is God sending this woman back into an abusive situation? And I really think that is not what's happening. God does not endorse abuse or misuse. And here's how I think we can know. First of all, we're not given the details of the kind of difficulty Hagar was experiencing at the hands of Sarai. We're told that it was harsh treatment. But here here is what I think can, can really show us God's heart towards us. Or more specifically, God's heart towards people who have been abused. And look, maybe you've experienced that and you're listening to this sermon and that that idea of Hagar having to return to that situation brought up some really painful memories or some painful feelings and emotions. Look, I, I want to say it grieves me what you've been through. And I'm so sorry. And God hates it. He grieves along with you. And here's how we know that God doesn't ex- Like God doesn't tell people to go back into abusive situations. In Matthew chapter 18, when Jesus instructs his disciples about how to handle it when somebody's sin is affecting them and the person is unrepentant, he tells them, get people around you. Get people around you. Take one other person with you and then get more people around you. Tell it to the church. In Jesus' mind, when we experience the ripple effects of sin, we are to get in a safe environment, to get around safe people who can protect us. That's God's heart. That's Jesus' teaching. Another example is in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul writes to Philemon, and he actually writes about a slave who fled from Philemon named Onesimus. And he writes to Philemon and he pleads with Philemon when Onesimus returns, not to treat him harshly, but to treat him as a brother in the Lord. I think that's important to say. God is not sending Hagar back into an abusive situation. And it's interesting to note that in verses 15 and 16, when she returns, Sarai isn't even mentioned. But he gives us a path. Kind of back to our story here. He gives Hagar a path. She can keep on going home to Shur, but God exhorts her to, to return to Abram and Sarai. Why does he tell her to do that? And that brings us to the third response that God has, that he makes us a promise. So he affirms our pain, he gives us a path, and he makes us a promise As soon as God tells Hagar to return to Abram and Sarai, he then says this in verse 10, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. When is the last time that God made that kind of promise to a person? It was to Abram when God blessed him. And he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make a great nation of you. you The entire world is going to be blessed through you now. This is extraordinary. That same God who made that promise to Abram now speaks a blessing over Hagar, an Egyptian maidservant of Sarai. And he says, look, I'm asking you to return to Abram and Sarai, but please understand that through that difficulty, there is a promise, a promise of my help, but also a promise of blessing and inheritance. When we read through the scriptures, God makes it clear that pain for God's sake, suffering for righteousness sake, as Jesus said it, is never meaningless. That it's always doing something to secure a glorious inheritance for those who love him. And this is the promise that God makes to Hagar. He says, look, I have a path for you and it's returning to, yes, maybe some difficult situations, but I'm going to help you. And more importantly, I'm going to bring you into profound blessing that you can't even imagine. The same is true for those who are followers of Jesus. Jesus said, look, anything you lose in this life will be restored to you both in this life and in the life to come. Nothing that we lose or suffer or or pain that we experience for the sake of Jesus is meaningless. It's all connected to a plan of blessing. 
that God has for us. As the scriptures say, God works out everything for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. So God's response, the God who sees, his response to what he sees is not just to get us out of all pain. After all, the Christian life is shaped like the cross through suffering into glory. But rather, he promises his sustaining grace in the difficulty and that through that difficulty, there is promise and blessing in it. And he never undermines the painfulness of the pain. Third, how we know that he sees. Wait, before we move on to that point, I think something needs mentioning. There's no such thing as a painless path, right? So God gives Hagar a path that leads back to Abram and Sarai. She could stay on the path to Shur and head home and hope for the best, but there's no world in which that path to Shur is a pain-free life. There's really only two paths in this life, and both include suffering and pain. I know many people, Christians and non-Christians alike, do you know what is a commonality between them? Their lives include pain and suffering in some way or another, at some point or another. No path you can take in this life excludes you from pain. The difference is that when you take the path that God sets in front of you, the God who sees, It's a path with pain, but with promise as well. I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. Third, how we know that he sees. How we know that he sees. After all, the angel of the Lord shows up to Hagar. So she has pretty good reason to be assured that God sees her pain and her difficulty. How can we know that he sees? Well, In a way, it's the same way that Hagar knows. You see, in Hagar's situation, when she fled from Abram and Sarai, do you know who should have gone after her? Abram. Abram was her husband, after all. It was his job to go after her, to protect her from Sarai's whims. But instead, he was apathetic. And Hagar needed, in a sense, a better, truer husband. And that's precisely what God did. God goes after Hagar and shows up to her to protect her and to bring her into promise. We have a true and better husband. And it's not the angel of the Lord like Hagar received. It is God's own son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came into the world and he described himself as the bridegroom and those who follow him as the bride. Now, I recognize if you're listening to this and you're a male, that might seem weird to you. You just got to get past it. The church is called the bride of Christ and you got to get past any kind of hurdles in your mind that that presents because it's really, really good news. Christ Jesus is our true and better husband. And in the same way that God goes after Hagar, Christ has come after us. You see, Christ is our true and better husband because he has left heaven and he came after us. When he entered into the world, he was coming to rescue us. And maybe you're listening to this and people have abandoned you. People who were entrusted with your care betrayed that trust and abandoned you. The good news of the gospel today is that you have a true and better husband who has cared for you and who left the glory of heaven for the derision of earth for you to rescue you. Christ is our true and better husband because he sympathizes with our pain. When Jesus came into the world, he never undermined the pain of those he loved. The family of Lazarus, when they were weeping at Lazarus' death, what did Jesus do? He wept with them. When Jesus looked out, I mean, talk about the God who sees. When Jesus looked out over Jerusalem, what did he do? He wept over Jerusalem. Because sin has its victims. And when Jesus surveyed the the victimization of sin, that human beings are victimized victimizers, he wept. But then he went to the cross. And Christ Jesus is our true and better husband 
Because by going to the cross and dying and rising again, Christ Jesus has secured God's promise of blessing in our life. See, Hagar was made a promise. And God would make good on that promise. God has made a promise to those who follow Jesus. And Christ is the one who has secured that promise through his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. When Jesus ascended into heaven and gave us his Holy Spirit, which is the seal of our inheritance, Jesus said, I will return. And when we get the prophetic writings about Jesus' return in the book of Revelation, we're told that there's a party, but it's not just any party. It is a wedding feast, and it's called the wedding feast of the Lamb because when Jesus returns, the bridegroom is coming back to bring his bride to himself. And we're told that in that new reality, the new heavens and the new earth, no pain, no weeping, no sin. All of the victimization of sin, all the ripple effects of unfaithfulness will be redeemed and wiped away by the love of our true and better husband, Jesus Christ. My hope and prayer is that this good news of the gospel ministers to your heart today. That you take it with you into every circumstance. And my hope also is that if this has touched on a nerve in areas that you have felt overlooked, take a moment to pray with somebody through the chat feature. Don't go it alone. Pray with somebody, asking them and trusting God to to come by His Spirit, the God who sees by His Spirit into your experience to give you His comfort and His encouragement. He is the God who sees and He loves us. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, You are the God who sees, who sees our pain, who sees the way in which we've been overlooked, trust has been betrayed, those entrusted with our protection have failed. God, the the unfaithfulness of others leaking all into our lives, and God, you, you, you see and you care. God, I pray for everybody listening to my voice, and specifically those who have experienced this kind of pain in significant ways. Would you enter into their experience by your presence and your power and your comfort? You are the God who sees. You are our comforter. Comfort those who need comfort today. And God, we look forward to to the day of the return of Jesus, our true and better husband. The one who will redeem all of our pain with his steadfast, covenant, loyal love. We love you and we thank you for these promises. We hold to them in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.